What do you guys want to do when you're older? Probably a scuba diver or a WWE wrestler. First Avenue sold out show with my friend. That's what I want to do. You want to sell out First Ave? No way. together as adults for real and maybe we would play a show at First Avenue at First Avenue and 7th Street at the cross point in downtown Minneapolis and it, 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 the whole show sells out. Whether you sing in the shower or play on the stage, you are a musician. We all are. And we all have places that we love, including public lands and waterways that we hold in common. What does music have to do with the stewardship of public lands? At Ecosong.net, we have rediscovered something that people, whales, and birds have known for millennia, that music makes place. We help community partners create the spree de corps they need to propel their work forward. 
while amplifying their messages concerning water stewardship, soil conservation, and habitat restoration. We also steward the common Sioux documentary film, such as Sentinels of Silence, Whale Watching, Noise in the Orca, currently premiering throughout the Pacific Northwest, United States, and the world. Meanwhile, our song garden project matches local musicians with neighborhood rain gardens, planting plaques engraved with QR codes so that visitors and passersby can hear each garden's song. We're bringing artists, musicians, and media makers together with gardeners to provide habitat for pollinators, conserve soil, and clean the water running off our roofs, driveways, and lawns. Would you be willing to join us? We don't want money, hits, likes, or shares. Just your voice and or the sound of your instrument, whatever that might be, guitar, flute, didgeridoo. Please consider taking part in our growing course for sustainability, biodiversity, healthy communities, and environmental justice. In her book, Alone Together, Sherry Turkle detailed the dangers of social media and digital technologies, including smartphones. It's hard to argue with Turkle. People are often alienated and disenfranchised by digital communication. New media that promised to bring us closer together widened the old device. I was reminded of the unrealized affordances of social media in 2014 when I came across a YouTube video by Adrian Shalafor, a singer-songwriter based in Victoria, Canada. Adrian sang Woody Guthrie's This Land is Your Land, revised to express a moving message about clear-cutting and environmental injustice with reverence for BC's wilderness. I then went looking for more videos like Adrian's simple, unedited, outdoor performance, music that expresses a deeply rooted sense of biophilia. Finding few, we began the Together Alone project. Together Alone promises to help connect us to each other and to the public places we all love. That sense of connection is more important than ever as a virus threatens to separate us and, as public lands become lost to privatization and despolation, more so than ever we need music, art, and science to remind us how and why these shared places matter, so that we can pass on that privilege to future generations. Music makes place. And so, whether in your neighborhood park or garden, or at a national park or United Nations Biosphere Reserve, whoever you are and wherever you live, please go out, perform, and share your musical moment in place with us. What we do to the air, we do to the water. What we do to the air, we do to the sea. What we do to the air, we do to the rivers. What we do to the air, we do to you and me. Hi everyone, welcome to session two, Transformation. We have loved hearing all of the feedback from yesterday's session and keep it coming today. Share your thoughts in the session chats and in the community space on the homepage. Have you been inspired to take mm -hmm. action? Are you transforming the way you think about something? We wanna hear it. And if you missed session one, don't worry, the recording will be available on Attendify until the end of the year. In this session, we'll learn about new technologies that could solve one of the world's greatest problems how we treat others who are different from us, and how we can nurture the youngest human minds. In some cases, a transformation has already taken us to new places, and in others, we'll be challenged to be better and make different choices. First up, Rahul Tiwari is CEO of global robotics firm Spooky Action. We'll hear how his drones, the longest flying in the world, by the way, are becoming part of the global fight to end poverty. Welcome, Rahul. I got on a flight to Johannesburg to save the world. Three years ago, I was a sophomore at Purdue University when I had an idea. I had developed a brand new type of drone one that could fly for 10 hours continuously without needing to land and recharge. My idea was to give that drone to every anti-poaching team in Africa, a surveillance camera 
for rhino and elephant. We would be able to catch poachers long before they got anywhere close to the precious animals. And I talked to a lot of experts about this, folks you'd see on Nat Geo, and they were generally positive about the idea, but the one thing I kept hearing was that, you know, Rahul, drones can't solve this problem. Not entirely. And I remember thinking, yeah, okay, but you haven't seen my drones. And then I landed in South Africa and reality sunk in. I learned that anti-poaching really has two faces. On the surface is a veneer, a veneer designed to bring in a lot of Western money. You see tough, armed to the teeth anti-poaching guys who look like they came out of Call of Duty, marching around the reserves, making sure that the poachers can't get anywhere near the rhino. But that is just a veneer, just designed to bring in money. Real anti-poachers aren't so much concerned about catching poachers as they are about poverty. You see, the people who do the poaching, the actual poachers themselves, they tend to be the poorest people from the poorest parts of the world. When they commit the poaching, they'll often write in their own blood on the body of the animal, please forgive me. It was an act of desperation. And this raises the question, how did they get close to the rhino in the first place? Aren't there supposed to be these armed guards? Well, it turns out the armed guards aren't really paid all that much. And they do love rhino and elephant, but they love feeding their kids more. Uh, and so bribing them is no difficult task. And then you ask yourself, okay, then why doesn't the reserve owner just pay the anti-poaching people better? It's because the reserve owner has learned that the best way to get international media, attention, press, and most importantly, money, is to have a poaching incident happen within your walls. Drones can't solve this problem. And I remember asking my friend and anti-poaching expert, L.B. Williams, what do we do? Do we need to give more aid, food, water? What's the catch here? And he pointed out the window of his Jeep to a group of kids wearing Toms. Now, Tom shoes on the surface is a brilliant concept. The idea is you buy a pair of shoes here in the United States and they'll donate one to a child in need. The problem is kids in Africa already have a place to buy shoes. African shoemakers make shoes, but African shoemakers can't compete with free. It's an example of how well-intentioned aid from the West can have unintended consequences in the field. All throughout Africa, aid flows in. Water, food, vaccines, these are really important. People will die without them. But then we get to bicycles, backpacks, shoes, laptops. And suddenly, in a lot of these countries, we aren't just fixing problems, we're creating them by not allowing them to grow. The Western world has gotten wise to this. They've started investing more in something called infrastructure aid. It's development aid that actually helps people grow. And back in the United States, I dropped out of school. I wanted to get in on this infrastructure aid thing. I had some cool drones. And I wasn't gonna learn how to put those two things together in thermodynamics class. After I dropped out, I started a small company and took my drones to conferences around the world, meeting the best and brightest to try to figure this out. And all my roads led back to one place, the internet. Now a poor village with the internet is unrecognizable from its former past. A farmer in that village, through the internet, now has access to everything humanity knows about farming. An entrepreneur in that village isn't just selling her goods to other villagers, she's selling them to rich Americans and bringing in more money into her economy than ever before. A young school child who couldn't afford textbooks now has access to Khan Academy and becomes the smartest little girl that village has ever seen. In short, the internet has become the greatest tool for economic and individual liberation the world has ever seen. And 49% of the world does not have it. Nearly half of the world does not have access to their best key out of poverty. 
what in the world is going wrong? Well, it turns out, like a lot of things in the world, the problem stems from one important thing, cash. Cell phone towers are not cheap, and you need a lot of them to cover an area, to have good enough coverage in a city or town. That makes a lot of sense to build enough cell phone towers to cover a rich city. It might even make sense financially to build enough towers to cover a poor city. But building enough cell phone towers to cover a poor suburb or a poor village? No, it doesn't work. No one is going to pay to build $10 million cell phone towers in an African village. And that's when I had an idea. What if, instead of 10 cell phone towers, we could get away with just three. The old model was building enough cell phone towers so you could have coverage everywhere all the time. But let's say we're working in a religious town. I know that on Sunday morning, those folks are gonna go to church. So I can put up three cell phone towers by the church and cover everybody. Then I know Monday morning, they're gonna go to work or school. So we'll put the cell phone towers near the commerce areas where the uh, schools and work is. And then in the evening, they're going to go home. So we can put the cell phone towers near the homes. There's one small problem. Cell phone towers are really big and really heavy and like dug into the ground. It's really hard. It's impossible to move a cell phone tower. But not if the cell phone tower can fly. Now, what I'm telling you is patently ridiculous. Using a drone as a cell phone tower? I talked to a lot of robotics experts about this, and they kindly informed me that the ESCs were going to explode, the motors were going to overheat, the propeller attachment just wasn't going to hold. This isn't possible, and so we did it anyway. I pulled together a team of the smartest people I knew into a garage in uptown Minneapolis, and we got to work. And a month later, after designing this system from the ground up, we thought we had something that might be able to do it. And so we took it to my parents' backyard and tied it down. We knew that if the motors could stay spinning, we didn't even need to fly. If the motors could stay spinning, we would be able to stay in the air. And so we started. We ran the motors. 24 hours passed. The motors are still going. Pretty good news. One week. Two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, that's a world record, five weeks. And after six weeks, 42 days, Minneapolis got hit by a blizzard and we had to shut our test down. But the point is we had a flying cell phone tower. It worked and we were gonna use it. So what did we do? Naturally, we went to France. Uh, every year in Cuberon, they run the French National Windsurfing Championship. And there are two big problems. The first is the town of Cuberon has a couple of hundred people and barely enough internet access to cover them. When you bring in a thousand or several thousand people for a windsurfing championship, their network just can't handle it. And the second big problem for windsurfing championships is that windsurfing is really, really boring to watch. Because you're standing on the beach and you have little dots out in the bay. And that's, that's the windsurfers, they look like ants. So we were gonna to try to solve both these problems. Within a couple of hours of arriving, we were able to put up our flying cell phone towers and cover the entire area with 4G and 5G network coverage. And we had a friend of ours who was also a drone pilot bring his drone along. He put on a 16K, 360 degree VR camera and flew his drone through the windsurfing championship. Suddenly, we could live stream that video to people wearing virtual reality goggles on the beach. You didn't have to watch little ants out in the sea. You could fly through the competition. And this was, of course, a huge development and a really cool new way to experience sports. But we were not done. A month later, we had the opportunity to be involved with Operation Convergent Response, a large-scale demonstration of America's first responders and networking abilities post-disaster. The situation we were involved in was a large-scale flood in Perry, Georgia. They actually flooded several city blocks and brought in hundreds of first responders to respond to the crisis. And while they were out in the field, 
our systems were flying to provide internet access. And we learned a lot of important things while we were there. When a disaster strikes, it takes a few days to a few weeks for the cavalry to roll in. The cellular on wheels systems, the permanent towers. For days and weeks, first responders operate in the dark without internet. And in the first days and weeks is when people are trapped in buildings and under floods. Today, it's a highly manual process to go in from building to building and find them. And unfortunately, you leave a lot of stones unturned. But if you can get internet access the day after a disaster happens, everybody trapped, their cell phone connects to the internet. Suddenly, you know exactly where everybody trapped is. And as a result, a couple of months later, and from this point, a few weeks ago, when Hurricane Laura slammed into the southern United States, one day later, our systems were there, being tested as internet for first responders. Now, the implications of our system for temporary events, for disaster recovery, are massive. But we started this, this idea of using a flying cell phone tower that you could move to help the global south, to help where this entire journey started in Africa. And so a few weeks ago, we got confirmation that we were going to send our first systems to Kenya as Africa's first drone-based flying cell towers. And I was telling some of my friends about this. Uh, including one who was a telecom operator in South Africa, and he told me a story. He told me about the story of how he tried to build a tower on a hill in South Africa, in a village. So he built this tower at his own expense and went back to his office. And a few days later, his phone buzzed. The cell phone tower had been stolen, sold for scraps. And so he went back at his own personal expense to build a new cell phone tower. And this time, for good measure, he put a sign in both English and close up, please don't steal this. He went back home, and within a few days, he got another notification. The cell phone tower had been stolen. He went back, and lo and behold, the cell phone tower was gone, and the sign was gone too. He had had enough. This time, he built a cell phone tower and put 600 volt spikes in the ground, threatening anybody who would touch his precious cell phone tower with the penalty of death. He went home, and a few hours later, he got a phone call from a less than pleased government official who informed him that his spikes idea was not only a safety violation, but a violation of human decency, human rights, and common sense, and that he needed to go and take those spikes down before he hurt somebody. So he drove back to the hill. By the time he got there, the tower and the spikes were already gone. This raises an important point. If we deploy, it can't be our cell phone tower. It's got to be theirs. It's the farmer who grows enough crops to feed his people. The entrepreneur who brings in unprecedented amounts of money into her local economy. And it's the student who becomes smarter than anyone that village has ever seen. When we deploy after a disaster, it's the first responders who are actually saving lives, enabled by our technology. And fundamentally, if we deploy it all, it'll have been because of you. You see, drones can't solve this problem unless people like you pay attention. People, citizens of the richest and most powerful country in the world, of which I am one too. And despite that, it took me a flight to South Africa to learn that some of the world's biggest problems were simply symptoms of poverty. It took me a flight to South Africa to learn that we already had a really great solution to help people get out of poverty, the internet. And almost half the world didn't have access. And it took a flight to South Africa to meet the people who inspired me enough to try to do something about it. I hope you'll consider this your flight to South Africa.
Wow. And Rahul doesn't just talk the talk. He had to reschedule his final checkpoint with our speaker coaches a couple weeks before the film shoot so he could be in the field providing internet for first responders immediately after Hurricane Laura. We are so lucky to have him and his team as part of the Twin Cities community. And we are loving the questions and the conversation we're seeing in the chat. So remember to share your questions for our speakers because they'll be joining us live for the Meet the Speakers session immediately after this. Now it is time to introduce our next speaker, and she literally wrote the book on xenophobia. Erica Lee is one of the nation's leading immigration and Asian American historians, and her book, America for Americans, which I happen to have right here, A History of Xenophobia in the United States, was called Essential Reading by Ibram X. Kendi, the author of How to Be Anti-Racist, and it won the American Book Award. To tell you more, here's Erica Lee. We need to talk about xenophobia, the fear and hatred of foreigners. It's a fear that's so great, we're supposed to run away as fast as we can and do whatever's necessary to protect ourselves from those dangerous foreigners. It's like it's about us versus them. And it's more than just prejudice or bigotry. In the United States, it's been built into our laws, our politics, and even the very definition of who counts as an American. My family knows what it's like to be targeted as outsiders. This is a photograph of my grandparents' much-loved restaurant in Brooklyn, New York. It's where my mother and her sisters would go every afternoon to make egg rolls and to work the cashier. My grandfather was a huge fan of, can you guess it, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He named his restaurant The New Deal. The irony was that he was a Chinese immigrant and he couldn't vote for FDR or anyone else because US laws prohibited Asian immigrants from becoming naturalized citizens. It's like America thought my family were dangerous outsiders who didn't belong and were unfit to become citizens. My family story echoes those of so many immigrants from across the United States. We know their experiences from their photographs, from their letters, from their poems, but also from the stories that they're sharing today. I'm a historian and I know it's so important to connect these dots between past and present because they help us understand how we got here, what's changed, and what hasn't. So let's start with how we got here. The United States is known as a nation of immigrants, right? A country that has welcomed almost 80 million people over the past 200 years, people like my family and perhaps many of yours. But the United States is also a nation of xenophobia, meaning that we have feared and even hated almost every immigrant group that's come to the United States. US government records show that we have actually removed over 57 million people since 1882. That's more than any other nation. So to say that our relationship with immigration is complicated, that's an understatement. This is because our immigration history reflects both America's promise, but also its failures. And let's be clear, it's also about race. From the very beginning of our country's history, white America defined Native Americans and African Americans as others, as outsiders, and has discriminated against them. The United States has waged war and cultural genocide upon Native Americans for centuries. It's been 400 years since the beginning of American slavery, but African Americans still remain unequal citizens, targets of police brutality, discrimination, and mass incarceration. How we've treated Native Americans and African Americans has influenced how we've treated immigrants. 
This is because xenophobia is a form of American racism. It identifies certain immigrants as the good ones. You know who they are. They're the non-threatening kind with the fun accents who contribute to America. And then, of course, there's the bad ones. These are the ones who don't speak English, who don't assimilate, who are a threat to the country. We have welcomed and even recruited the good immigrants. We have banned and expelled the bad ones. It's been a matter of national origin and religion, class, gender, sexuality, but especially race. This was true when our country was first founded, and it's true today. So let's take a short walk through history to see how this works. It's the 1700s, and Germans are suffering for months on crowded and filthy ships. They're headed to the colonies. They're looking for land and economic opportunity. But when they arrive, they're labeled swarms of swarthy aliens who herd together. Who said this? None other than one of our founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin. Samuel Morse, you may know him as the inventor of the telegraph. He actually wrote a book that called Catholic Immigration a Foreign Conspiracy Against the United States. There was a minister in Boston named Theodore Parker. He called the Irish the most ignorant and barbarian race. These immigrants were considered to be such a threat that riots broke out in American cities. One of the deadliest happened in Louisville, Kentucky in 1855. This is when 500 citizens tore through the streets, attacking and killing foreigners. That day is still remembered as Bloody Monday. The Chinese were the next to come. They first came to try their luck as part of the California Gold Rush. Later, they were recruited to build the country's first transcontinental railroad. But when that work was done, lawmakers and labor leaders shouted that the Chinese must go. The threat was considered to be so great that in 1882, the United States passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. This is where we see the difference that race makes. The Chinese Exclusion Act was the first federal law to single out an entire group for exclusion based on their race and their class. Chinese were barred from becoming naturalized citizens. They were beaten, they were killed, they were driven out of cities and towns from across the U.S. West and they were deported. Chinese immigrants detained at the Angel Island Immigration Station in San Francisco wrote poems of frustration and despair on the prison walls. You can actually still read this one at the museum there. It reads, from now on, I'm departing far from this building. All of my fellow villagers are rejoicing with me. Don't say that everything within is Western styled, even if it is built of jade, it has turned into a cage. The Exclusion Act was law of the land for 61 years. By the 1930s, all other Asians were also barred from the United States and from becoming naturalized citizens. Soon, immigrants from Southern, Eastern, and Central Europe were coming. They were also looking for economic opportunity or, like Jewish families in Russia, freedom from persecution. When asked why he was coming to America, one Jewish refugee said, in America lies hope. That hope may prove futile, he said, but here the fears are certainty. It was refugees and immigrants like him that helped to inspire Emma Lazarus' poem, the one that is inscribed at the base of the Statue of Liberty. You know the one. It starts, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. But a growing number of Americans believed that these immigrants and refugees were dangerous. A group calling itself the Immigration Restriction League called Italians the most ignorant race of Europe. National magazines published stories on the so-called Jewish invasion of America. And guess what? The Ku Klux Klan got involved. They were busy organizing campaigns of racial terror and white supremacy targeting African Americans, but they were also anti-immigrant 
and anti-Semitic. In the 1920s, they published this pamphlet calling for a vigilant protection of America for Americans against the flood of foreigners coming to the United States. So we can see how white supremacy, racism, and xenophobia work together in groups like the KKK, but we can also see it in our immigration policies. By the 1920s, the United States is leaving the doors open to immigrants from Northern and Western Europe, but we're restricting immigration from Southern, Central, and Eastern Europe, and we're shutting the door altogether to Asians. The US Border Patrol gets established. Pretty soon it becomes a crime to enter the country without documentation. These laws last for decades. And by 1960, immigration is at a historic low in the United States. But in 1965, something fabulous happens. The Civil Rights Movement helps to usher in a new law, one that reopens the United States to new immigration. We have immigrants from Asia, Latin America, and Africa coming to our country again, transforming our nation. Their students, their workers, their doctors and family members. And they're also refugees fleeing another war. One refugee described their plight. I was born in Vietnam into a world at war. We lived and breathed war. We dreamt of peace. Eventually, over one million refugees from Southeast Asia were resettled in the United States. But at the same time, other policies are making it even more difficult for immigrants, especially those from Mexico, to enter the country. So a growing number come without documentation. An immigration backlash rises. We have politicians like Patrick Buchanan who describe Mexican immigration as an illegal invasion of the United States. The U.S. begins its war on illegal immigration. The U.S.-Mexico border gets militarized and growing numbers of Mexican and Latinx immigrants are arrested, detained, and deported. And then comes 9-11. Islamophobia, the fear and hatred of Muslims rises. There are some Americans who blame all Muslims for the terrorist attacks. Some politicians deliberately feel Islamophobia as a way to get voters to the polls. The FBI reports that anti-Muslim hate crimes rises by 1,600%. Today, xenophobia is as strong as it has ever been before. Current policies under the Trump administration include the Muslim ban, the wall along the U.S.-Mexico border, and a near end to our refugee resettlement program. During the current coronavirus pandemic, we're actually demonizing the very people who are keeping us safe, like public health care workers who become victims of anti-Asian hate crimes, or undocumented meat packers who lack safe working conditions just to get food on our tables. We're continuing a tradition that has deep roots. History shows that xenophobia has been part of our country since the very beginning. It's one of the ways in which race and racism works in America. And it's not going to go away anytime soon. But history also shows that xenophobia hurts us all. It is not just something that happens to immigrants. It feeds division, white supremacy, white nationalism. It furthers racial discrimination. The stakes could not be higher, and we must all take action. We must advocate for immigrants and refugees. We must challenge ineffective and cruel laws. And yes, we must vote xenophobic politicians out of office. But in order to fight hate, we must do more. So that's why I'm going to call on all of you to do something. Sometime today, tomorrow, this week, I want you to ask yourselves this question. What am I doing to challenge xenophobia and racism in my job, in my community, in my family? Let me share with you how I've answered this question. I'm lucky, I'm an educator. 
Many of my students are first-generation immigrants and refugees. I know that their stories are not yet part of the history books. I know that there's no archive that holds them and preserves them for future generations. I feel that it's my job to change that. I need to help them tell their stories because if they don't do it, who will? And if there's no archive to hold them, then we need to build it ourselves. So that's why I created the Immigrant Stories Digital Storytelling Project with my colleagues at the Immigration History Research Center. It helps anyone, anywhere, create, preserve, and share their stories for free. There are now over 350 stories in the collection. Some of them were created by my students, but most by strangers from across the country. Let me share two of them with you. The first is Tiago's. Tiago talks about what it was like to grow up in this country as an undocumented dreamer, the hardships he faced, the struggles he had, but also the joy that he felt when he finally became a legal permanent resident and got that driver's license. My time is now, he said. And then there's Liang. Liang describes how this super hip Sony stereo, she called it, was her family's most treasured possession while they were living in a refugee camp in Thailand. And how once in America, they used that stereo to send audio letters back to relatives left behind in Laos. It's been decades since her family came to the United States. And that Sony stereo, is now sitting on a shelf collecting dust, but it is still one of her family's most treasured possessions. These stories and the hundreds of others like them have the power to change the way we think about immigration and challenge xenophobia and racism. They're the stories of real people, not stereotypes. They help us see what unites us rather than what divides us. We need more creative solutions like these that foster empathy, solidarity, and justice. So do the work needed to help create this change. We must all work together to build a future that is not about us versus them, but we. We thought that beautiful short video made by Jay Christensen featuring another child of Chinese immigrants, Michelle Kwan, skating on a Minnesota lake, wipe your lake if you're curious, was a perfect pairing with Erica's talk. And I have to share that just this month, Erica and her team unveiled their latest projects, Immigrants in COVID America, which documents the impact of COVID-19 on immigrants and refugees in the US. So 
If you'd like to contribute a story, visit their website. Our next two speakers have ideas that are so closely related, we wanted to show their talks back to back. First up is Stephanie Carlson, a distinguished McKnight University professor at the Institute of Child Development at the University of Minnesota. Stephanie is, well, she's kind of a big deal. She is internationally recognized as a leader in the study of executive function. And what does that mean exactly? Well, I'll let her tell you. And after Stephanie, we're gonna hear from Delon Crosby, who's the CEO of Say Kid. He has combined voice technology, so think of Alexa or Google Home, with a plush toy robot to help kids learn by empowering them to play the role of teacher. So remember to put your questions for Stephanie and Delon into the session chat in Attendify. We're gonna hear from them afterwards and they might just answer your question. Now let's hear those talks. If I were to ask you to think of a person you know who's really patient, persistent, emotionally balanced, flexible when things change, and takes the long view when it comes to pursuing their goals, I'm guessing you would not be thinking of a three or four year old child. It will come as no surprise that young children are not very good at these things, known as executive function skills. I've been studying these skills both as a mom and as a professor in child development. At one point, I was even brought in by Sesame Street to help Cookie Monster with his self-control, although I'm not sure how successful that's been. <laughs> executive function refers to the brain-based processes we use to control our thoughts, actions, and feelings. They include holding information in mind, controlling impulses, and thinking flexibly. They help us persevere toward our goals, but also adapt to changing circumstances. Today, I propose we ask ourselves, what would happen if we tended to the development of executive function earlier in children's lives? All of us investing in cultivating these kinds of skills from the roots up. Whether you're a parent, a teacher, or a researcher, we know kids tend to be impulsive and inflexible. For example, no matter how much you think you've prepared your young child for a trip to the store to pick up just a few things for dinner, no treats, there is a chance it will end in a tantrum in the checkout line. This can happen when they get their mind set on something they feel they must have right now. If you know a teenager, this might ring true at times as well. I actually found myself in this situation with my daughter Natalie when she was three years old. She refused to leave the store without a new doll. We ended up at opposite ends of the toy aisle facing each other with our hands on our hips. It was a showdown. We made it out of the store without the doll, but to be honest, for a moment I was at a loss and I thought I might give in. I wished I had better parenting strategies at my disposal in that moment. We know from neuroscience that executive function depends primarily on brain networks involving the prefrontal cortex. This is the frontmost part of the brain and the last brain region to develop. It's not fully mature until one's mid-20s, and then, unfortunately, it begins to decline with age. Because of this, for a long time, some scientists believe young children simply have no executive function at all. We now know that's not true. Take, for example, the so-called marshmallow test. A researcher offers a child a treat, such as a marshmallow, and explains that she needs to leave the room, but if the child can wait to eat it until after she returns, then the child can have two marshmallows. So it's kind of like deciding between taking a vacation now or saving for retirement. Back in the 1960s, Walter Michel and his colleagues noticed that some four-year-olds would wait patiently up to 15 minutes for a larger reward, whereas others grabbed the treat almost immediately. I was fortunate to be able to collaborate with Walter Michel before his death. We were wondering whether young children's ability to delay gratification has changed at all since he first did those studies in the 1960s. And to our surprise, using the same procedure, we discovered that preschool-aged children today wait significantly longer on the marshmallow test than they did 50 or 60 years ago. Two full minutes longer on average, which is an eternity in the mind of a four-year-old. We don't know exactly why this is, but it does track with the rise in IQ in the general population, as well as preschool enrollment during the same time frame. 
my colleagues and I have developed and validated additional assessments of executive function for children as young as two years of age. I even co-founded a company with my partner, Phil Zalazzo, to further develop these tools and make them more widely available. And they don't all involve marshmallows. With the Minnesota Executive Function Scale, a virtual card sorting game that requires children to switch flexibly between roles, we've learned that executive function performance improves dramatically in the early years, as shown here from age two to six. But even the youngest kids could demonstrate some ability on the lower levels of the game. So if executive function skills can be measured in early childhood, and we know they'll improve with time, why should we care about them? The reason is because they matter more to children's success than you might think. Of course, parents and teachers want to raise kids to be happy and successful. Success is often defined in terms of academic achievement and education level, but we know it's more than that. It also depends on social and emotional intelligence, such as being a team player and having empathy for others. I'm going to offer a way of thinking about this as the tree of success. It has two major branches academic and social-emotional competence. And we can think of executive function skills as the roots of this tree, and of reflection as the driver, or the taproot, if you will, for these skills. Reflection in this sense is basically thinking twice, pausing to consider your options before reacting, and monitoring yourself as you go. On the left side of the tree, there's abundant evidence of a link between executive function and academic achievement. Kids with stronger executive function skills in preschool score higher on math and reading assessments in third grade and are more likely to go on to complete high school and graduate from college. On the right side of the tree, research shows that children with strong executive function skills are better at taking other people's perspectives and reflecting on their own. And when they grow up, they're more likely to engage in healthy behaviors like exercise and less likely to encounter trouble with drugs and alcohol or be convicted of a crime. It's important to note that these relations often hold even after controlling for intelligence and family background. So then, if it's so important, how do we build strong executive function? We can use the tree metaphor to illustrate what my colleagues and I have learned so far. First, you need a rich soil. This includes basic safety as well as nutrition and sleep. Iron and other micronutrients are essential for healthy brain development, starting prenatally. And with respect to sleep, we've learned it's not so much the overall amount of sleep, but rather the hours of consolidated nighttime sleep in infancy that can predict executive function skills years later. Of course, this could be partially explained by their parents getting better sleep too. You'll also need lots of sun. The sun is caregiving. It's best when it's warm and sensitive, but our research has shown that another factor also matters, being what's called autonomy supportive. This is when parents and teachers take the child's perspective, offer choices, and provide just enough support, but not too much. Take the example of a young child working on a puzzle. They might pick up a piece and try to jam it into place, but it just won't fit, and you can see the signs of a meltdown coming. You could help by telling them what to do, or doing it for them. But imagine how different it would feel if you simply nudged the correct piece into their view and they discovered it on their own. Owning it is needed before controlling it. In other words, giving children autonomy with just enough support gives them a sense of agency over their own actions, the very same actions we're expecting them to learn to control on their own. You'll also need plenty of rain. We can think of this as language input from the environment. When children are spoken to and asked open-ended questions, even as babies, this builds their word bank. They'll need these words later for what's called the language of thought, when kids literally talk themselves through solving problems and resisting impulses. For example, when we give children the marshmallow test in our lab, it's not unusual for them to suddenly burst into a song about waiting, like this one. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Come back, wait. And children who do this tend to wait significantly longer. Language also helps children reflect upon and control their emotions. Like the saying, if you can name it, you can tame it, 
Labeling how we feel can take the heat out of it. You might even find yourself using this strategy to manage your own emotions, and doing so out loud can serve as a good role model for kids. To give you an example, I remember my oldest child, Anna's first day of kindergarten. Neither of us was doing very well with the goodbye. I was reassuring my daughter that she would have so much fun at school while holding back my tears. Then a mom next to me, who's more seasoned with this on her third time around, had a suggestion. Tell her how you feel. I was a little stunned, thought, how I feel? This is about how she feels. But I decided to give it a try as my daughter was clinging to my leg. And I said, I'm feeling anxious about today. She looked up at me and said, me too, but I'll see you later. And she let go. Of course, there will be occasional windstorms, like jitters on the first day of school. And things do not always go as planned. For the kid in the grocery store, that could mean there's a longer line than you expected, or you accidentally chose the aisle with candy by the register. For the child working on the puzzle, there could be a piece missing, or it's too advanced, or they have to stop playing for bedtime. Now, if you were beginning to think of executive function as all work and no play, I can tell you that's not the case. Playful settings motivate kids to stick with activities that build executive function skills through games you might remember, like Red Light, Green Light and Simon Says. And our research has shown that pretend play, such as imagining you're a superhero, can significantly improve children's ability to think flexibly, persist at tasks, and manage their emotions. We call this the Batman effect. As one four-year-old boy in our research put it, Batman never gets frustrated. <laughs> Encouraging children to step outside of themselves through imagination, which is so natural in play, could help them reflect on their thoughts, actions, and feelings, and in turn have greater control over them. In contrast to these positive influences, pests eat away at the roots of the tree. This refers to toxic stress. Unlike the occasional challenges, it's the kind of stress that is pervasive and uncontrollable in the child's life, including trauma from adverse experiences. Toxic stress is the enemy of executive function. It ramps up the emotion regions of the brain while shutting down the prefrontal cortex, upsetting the balance needed to cope effectively. Abuse, institutionalization, racism, and yes, probably growing up in a pandemic can all take a serious toll on our kids' executive function skills. But the effects of toxic stress can be reduced by attending to all the positive environmental influences I've described. Finally, if we pan out, we see that this individual tree is surrounded by dozens of other trees with interconnected roots and an ecosystem. This stands for the importance of having a sense of belonging to a community and culture. It means we're all in this together and that having good executive function will not on its own guarantee good choices. It needs to be embedded in the context of our values. Look, kids will be kids. They'll have their meltdowns in the store, cling to your leg, and stuff the whole bag of marshmallows in their mouths. But I'd be lying if I told you they'll all grow out of it on their own. Instead, maybe, with more tending to the good soil of adequate nutrition and sleep, the warm sun of sensitive and autonomy supportive caregiving, the quenching rain of rich language input, the occasional storms of mild stress, the play that stretches the imagination and makes it fun, and some pest control to reduce toxic stress. We can support the development of reflection and executive function, these roots of success, as individuals and as a community. Thank you. A few years ago, my son Cal was a happy four-year-old little boy who loved school so much 
that when he got a pet fish, he decided to name it after his teacher, Mr. Barr. Then one day, Mr. Barr left, and the teacher that replaced him didn't have the same tools or training to relate to Cal. Happy grams turned into nasty grams, which ultimately turned into this voicemail. Hi, Don. Um, I've been with Cal most of the day today, and he is totally out of control, disrespectful, disobedient. I need you to come and get him, and he is not going to return. I hope you understand. Thank you. Bye. In that moment, I felt as if I had just failed at the one thing I care most about, being a great dad. It reminded me of the time that I was in school, and like Cal, on my way out. Years ago, I stumbled into Normandale Community College when I couldn't get a job at a fast food restaurant. When you show up to school the day before classes start, you get all the courses that no one else wants. For me, that was chemistry. In my second semester, I had chemistry with Dr. Reznicek, and I finally landed that job, except this restaurant had real napkins and real silverware. So the obvious thing to do was to drop out. Then one day, Dr. Reznicek asked to see me after class. I spent the entire period trying to figure out what I had done wrong. When I approached him, he handed me a piece of paper. I looked at it, it was my exam. I'd gotten 75 out of 100. So I asked, what's the problem? And he looked at me through glasses that only chemistry teachers wear and said, I'd like to see you get 100. That's all he said, but that's not all I heard. I heard, Delon, you can do this. You have the ability, and I care. So for the rest of the semester, I tried to get 100. And although I never actually got a perfect score, I stayed in school, nearly doubled my GPA, and eventually graduated from Harvard. So even though I had no idea what was going on with Cal or how to be helpful, I had to get 100 because this time it wasn't just personal, it was paternal. In education, there's a saying that a parent is a child's first teacher. So I tried to become the best teacher that I could be. I immersed myself in the research on what kids need to succeed and how to develop it. I met with experts, I read papers, I took classes. I spent a lot of time in classrooms and I learned a lot from teachers. The deeper I went, the more I realized that our education system is broken. And I wasn't sure if it was fixable. In fact, I felt that if we took all of the science on child development and then just did the opposite, it would more closely resemble US education. What if changing education was as simple as learning how to play? I'm gonna share with you how voice technology and more specifically a voice interactive toy has the potential to change the conversation on how kids learn. There are three big problems in education. The first is that we're not focused on the most important period of development. The first eight years of life are critical. It's when we start to build our social emotional, language, and cognitive skills. However, for every dollar that we spend on K through 12 education, we only spend about a nickel on early education. To put that into context, 90% of the brain is formed before kindergarten, but more than 90% of funding comes after it. Not surprisingly, we have one of the lowest rates of early childhood education. The second big problem is that we're not focused on the most important skills. Although science and technology and math are incredibly important, the skills that often lead to success in school and beyond are things like empathy, self-control, creativity, grit, a growth mindset. Basically all of the skills that you hear about in TED Talks, but that we rarely focus on in schools. And the last problem has to do with how we engage kids. Cal's not the first kid to be called disobedient and I'm not gonna be the last student to think that they're in trouble when a teacher wants to meet. That's my point. We often focus on teaching kids to be obedient and to follow directions than on actually inspiring them to learn. I believe technology has to play a role. But if we're being honest, most technology wasn't designed for early learners. Touch interfaces aren't natural. Rigid form factors aren't playful. And visual content often overstimulates kids rather than engaging them. In fact, I'd contend most technology is not only not helping, it's actually exacerbating the problems. Let me explain why. 
When kids lack access to school, they gain access to something else, screens. Although the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends kids under six to spend no more than one hour per day in front of a screen, the average young child spends almost three hours per day in front of them. And when schools close due, due to COVID, screen time more than doubled. So why is excessive screen time such a big problem? Well, do you remember that PSA from the 1980s that showed what our brains look like on drugs? Well, this is a kid. This is a kid on a screen. And this is what kids' brains look like on screens. In the blue are the neural pathways associated with language and literacy. Think of them as our information highways that we want to be focused and organized. On the left, you see the brain of a preschooler who is often read to. And on the right is the brain of a preschooler who spends a couple hours per day in front of a screen. As you can see, the brain on the left is far more organized and focused than the brain on the right. It's much more sporadic. The truth is, we don't have a practical, scalable way to reach kids where they're at, which is often at home, without a screen. The other issue is that kids don't build social skills by pushing buttons or self-control by staring at screens. These are all developed through back and forth interaction and by modeling behavior. So they're hard to build and they're hard to scale. The bottom line, is that most technology is not only impractical during the most important period of development, but it's also impractical for developing the most important skills. And screens aren't just affecting kids. The average adult spends almost 10 hours per day in front of a screen. Whether we like it or not, adults are always teaching because kids are always learning. If we're serious about changing education, we're gonna have to change our behavior. But how do we do it? How do we engage young kids that are hard to reach, help them build skills that are difficult to teach, and how do we help adults to practice what we preach? What if we replaced screen time with speech? Kids don't learn to read until around age six, but they can speak in sentences by age three. A few years ago, voice technology like Alexa was just starting to take off. And Cal <laughs> literally dreamed about playing with toys. So I thought if I could combine voice technology in the form factor of a plush toy, every child could learn in a safe, natural, and scalable way. This is what it looked like. And this is Cal working on his letter blends. Do stone and story start with the letters ST or SH? ST. <laughs> Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Ten in a row. Way to go. Cal loved it, and I love that you could see his wheels really turning. We even started winning awards. In fact, the letter game that you just saw won the grand prize in the Alexa EdTech Challenge. So effectively, I had developed a smart toy that could engage young kids that are hard to reach. So then I wanted to know, could we help kids build skills that are difficult to teach? You saw Cal working on his early literacy skills. And so I wanted to know, could we help kids build social and emotional skills, like empathy? The best example that I've ever seen to help kids build empathy is Jane Elliott's Blue Eyes, Brown Eyes experiment. In 1968, she separated her third grade class by eye color. And she told the kids with blue eyes that they were smarter and would get special privileges. Pretty soon, the kids with blue eyes teased the other kids, and then they all stopped playing together. And then she reversed roles and gave the other kids privileges. And by the end, every child knew exactly what it was like to be teased for being different. I have a secret. Robots don't have feelings or empathy. So I thought if I could create an interactive experience where kids could teach the robot what it's like to be a kid or how it feels to be different, we might help them build perspective, which is the root of empathy. Now, let me share with you some perspective on what it's like to be a seven-year-old with two younger brothers. I love being two years old because every day I learn something new. I also get free admission to the train museum. I'm curious. How old are you? Seven. 
Wow, you are so old. What is it like to be seven? It's like you have to be the leader of everything. By empowering kids to play the role of teacher, I realized we could help kids build social skills, executive function skills, almost anything. In fact, I even created a cleanup game where kids could teach the robot <laughs> what it's like to clean up, which comes in really handy when you've got three young kids at home. More importantly, it no longer relied just on artificial intelligence, but it relied on something greater human intelligence and emotional intelligence. More importantly, we have a way to engage young kids that are hard to reach, help them build skills that are difficult to teach. And so then I wondered, can we help adults to practice what we preach? Because kids have zero chance at reaching their full potential without support of adults. Although we all want kids to be successful, the real question is, how do we become the best teachers that our kids need us to be by talking. One of the most commonly cited studies in the history of education research is Hart and Risley's study on early language environments. It's what led to the so-called word gap. It turns out that it's less about how many words kids are exposed to and much more about engaging them in rich back and forth conversation and responsive language, like you could see in the videos. This isn't hard but it does take practice. Let's think, why is it so important that we talk with kids and not at them? I want you to imagine that you're a four-year-old and you're constantly being told to stop, be quiet, sit down. Would that change how you feel about learning? Kids will often forget what we say, at least my kids do, but they will never forget how we make them feel. It took me almost 20 years to realize why Dr. Resincheck could change my trajectory in one conversation. And it has to do with something called self-determination theory. And it's the most important thing that I've learned about human development. Basically, kids learn best when they feel three things. When they feel competent, like they're successful. When they have agency or control over their development. And most importantly, when they feel loved. It's really easy to label kids as problems these days. Cal was never the problem. In fact, Cal, or C-A-L, was actually the solution. Because helping kids feel competent, giving them agency and showing them love is exactly how we inspire them to love learning. And you may even get a fish named after you too. Now, of course, you don't need a voice interactive toy to do this, but it can help, and here's why. When kids play the role of teacher, they feel competent. When kids are guiding play, whether by themselves or with others, they have agency. And when adults learn to model conversational turn-taking and responsive language, they feel loved. So it started out as a kid's toy, has now also become an adult toy, but we'll call it an educational tool, so nobody gets in trouble. More importantly, you can see how a voice interactive toy or tool can engage young kids that are hard to reach, help them build skills that are difficult to teach, and even help us big kids to practice what we preach while getting kids excited about learning again. Our education system has been failing many kids for far too long. Technology is not going away, but it can be invisible. Voice technology has the potential to change education by helping kids play to learn while adults learn to play. Although play is one of the first things that we all learn how to do, we often forget how to play as we get older. If we want to change education, we all need to relearn how to play. Let me close with a story about a superhero. Her name is Mrs. Nagel, and she was Cal's next teacher. When she realized that Cal loved coins and was good at math, she created a coin counting game just for him, and he looked forward to it every single day. Although it wasn't easy, she hand sewed Cal's little heart right back together by helping him feel confident, giving him agency, and she loved him, and we loved her. Pretty soon, Cal was back to feeling like Cal again. No technology can ever replace the role of a supportive adult, but even superheroes need help. 
And that's the role that a voice interactive toy can play. Thank you. I am constantly just blown away by the talent and expertise we have in our TEDx Minneapolis community. And if you're like me, you are probably wondering what Stephanie thinks of Delon's <laughs> robot and how Delon is integrating Stephanie's findings into his designs. Well, they are both going to be joining us in the Meet the Speaker session on Attendify right after this, and we're going to hear from both of them to find out. And after that, we have some incredible breakouts where you can talk to Delon's robot, be serenaded with a song written just to compliment you, write an apology or pardon, pitch your TEDx talk and get feedback from Megan and our team, or talk with me about joining our core team. You'll find all the details in Attendify. This afternoon, starting at 2 p.m. Central, we will share the final four talks, and you won't want to miss these. And later, we have the exclusive after party where we will celebrate with all the speakers, donors, and sponsors starting at 4.30. And finally, tomorrow to close out the weekend, organizer and healer Sarita Collette will lead us through a meditation embodiment and collective reflection at 11 a.m. Central. And if you can't make everything, don't worry. All this content will be available on demand after this weekend through the end of the year for ticket holders. And for all of you joining us on YouTube, this is where we say goodbye for now. For everyone else, navigate to your schedule tab and click on session two, meet the speakers. We'll kick things off over there with a conversation with Delon and Stephanie starting in about five minutes. <laughs>